First of all, I'd like to thank uh, yeah, the Scientific Organizing Committee for inviting me, for giving this short talk, uh, which you know, I will try to describe the, the interesting current situation in cosmology uh, in just 15 minutes. And I have to do some historical review. So I'll try to, to, yeah, to speed and, and, and just move, move ahead. Um, so, okay, so uh, up to a, few, a couple of years ago, it's fair to say that you know, among the cosmological community, uh, there was uh, an agreement on what was called the, cosmological, uh, the concordance cosmological model, uh, which was somehow depicted by this slide I'm trying to show here on slide two. And this is that you know, uh, we understand that, uh, or we understood that the universe uh, was created in the Big Bang, and then you know it followed a, a, an epoch of uh, rapid in, uh, expansion during the inflationary phase. Oops, and then and then uh, you know and it was essentially cooling down. Uh, and during this cooling down of the of the universe, we understood that uh, you know the electrons recombined the protons at uh, around 400, uh, 400 million years after the Big Bang. And then the cosmic microwave background radiation was released uh, during the combination epoch or uh, the coupling epoch, and it was just traveling through the entire visible universe until reaching the observer, right? And, uh, and you know, this cos concordance cosmological model, we understood that in the late, uh, at late epochs, the expansion of the universe would be accelerated by a, by a mysterious repulsive agent that we dubbed as, as dark energy. So this, this model was uh, founded on, first, uh, uh, on the first precise observations of the cosmic microwave background anisotropies by the WMAP mission, that, you know, the first data release came out in, in, in the year 2003. And these uh, observations were combined with uh, low redshift observations of supernovae and distribution of the large scale structure, especially distribution of galaxies. All these observations yielded a picture where most of the, uh, you know, where the energetic budget of the, of, the, of the universe was given by this cosmic pie, where almost 70% was uh, due to this dark energy, this repulsive uh, source of energy that was causing the exp expansion of the universe to accelerate. And then most of the matter, and the rest would be matter, uh, most of it would be like in, this, in, the, in the form of dark matter, about which we know very little. And then only 5%, around 5% of the energy in the, in the universe will be given by the, you know, by, the, by the atoms and the matter we are familiar with. So this, uh, this, uh, you know, this combination of high redshift uh, observation of the, cosmic, of the cosmic microwave background, or the CMB, and at lower redshift from the galaxy distribution, the supernovas, uh, you know, uh, allowed us to have like a consistent picture of the of the universe. We, you know, the cosmological model was like a, a railway, which was able to to translate, uh, you know, our observations of the high redshift universe towards low redshift universe, and actually was able to make predictions for some uh, cosmological parameters also at low redshift. In particular, the the, the Hubble the Hubble constant, or the which is given the, the expansion rate of the universe. Um, so this is uh, somehow a slide showing the, the, this, uh, how different observations at different redshifts, the cosmic microwave background, the supernovae, and the BO, were all agreeing, converging on, the, on, a, on, a, on a single picture of the universe, which was a flat universe dominated by a dark energy, by a lambda term, and where 70, around 70% 70 of this omega lambda, which is given the, the fraction of the, of the dark energy, of the energy due to this repulsive, uh, repulsive component, was around 70%, whereas the matter was around 30%. This was the picture, say, up to yeah, a few years ago, right? However, as time proceeded, uh, observational uh, uh, observations, uh, cosmical observations, improved their precision, improved their quality, both at the, at the CMB side. Here we're comparing the CMB maps from WMAP and from the Planck mission. Uh, they were, these CMB experiments were actually uh, in, the, in the latest versions so for, for Planck and also for SPT and ACPOL for all their ground-based experiments were able to provide more accurate measurements at the smaller angular scales with better control on systematics and contaminants. And at the same time, um, at low redshifts, there were you know, deeper galaxy surveys, more precise supernovae observations. So now we're finding a situation where the contours do not overlap anymore, where you know, depending which data uh, sets you combine, you're getting contours that are not overlapping and where you have different measurements of the same cosmological parameters that should be universal for the entire universe, according to the model. Tensions have arisen, and, and, and now, you know, some, for, for some part of the cosmological community, we're living in uh, times of, of at least revision, some people say crisis, and this is the topic I want to describe. So it seems that, you know, this way well, some have some crack in this, and for some, for some members of the community, you know, we may be facing a, a crackdown of the, of, the, of the model, and we should revise, you know, uh, we should actually revisit the foundations of our cosmological model. 
So this is you know, the, the topic of the talk. So here I'm trying to summarize um, the main sources for this tension uh, for the cosmological model. Probably the strongest one, surely the strongest one is are the measurements of, of, uh, the, Hubble punk, of the Hubble parameter, H0, which is given the expansion rate of the universe, which is ranging from three, I would say even up to six sigma or five sigma. So people are not talking about tension, people are starting to talk about problem or even crisis. And there are, there are two other observables or three observables that are also in tension, that are at, but at the lower significance, so around three sigma, right? So I'll spend more time talking about the first issue, which is related to the measurement of the, of the Hubble expansion rate, that's the Hubble parameter, H naught. So in this plot, you can see in the top, I'm not sure if you can see my, my, my cursor, in the top part, in the top part of this of this uh, panel of this plot, you can see the measurements of this uh, of this H, of the Hubble constant based upon uh, CMB measurements, measurements of the cosmic microwave background, and measurements of the, the special distribution of galaxies that uh, are searching for uh, for the projection of the baryonic acoustic oscillation scale. This is a physical scale that is produced in the early universe. How it projects at different redshifts is giving us precise information on H naught on the Hubble constant. In the middle part of this panel, you see local measurements or direct measurements of, a, of H0. And as you can see, there's a strong discrepancy between those measurements based upon early measurements, based upon the, the, the BAO scale, and other measurements, late measurements, based uh, about, upon more direct methods. So we'll try now to review in more detail each of these two approaches. First, I start with the early methods, looking at the BAO scale. So this baryonic acoustic oscillation scale is related to the sound horizon of the universe at the epoch of where the, the protons recombine the, uh, the, elect the electrons recombine the protons to form a neutral universe at redshift 1000 or when the universe was around about 400,000 um, years old. So this sound horizon actually has, uh, you know, the, 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 this, this, this way of measuring H0 has pros and cons as every method, right? So the pros is that the theory behind is relatively simple. So this sound horizon has little dependence on cosmological parameters that are very well known or relatively well known. And actually the theoretical model that you need to use in order to infer H naught from the measurements is very simple. It's just linear theory, linear perturbation theory in cosmology or mildly nonlinear. And, uh, you know, and you actually have the, 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 the strong plus that two different observables, which is the CMB observable and the spatial distribution of galaxies at very different reaches with very different systematics are actually providing very, very close measurements. If I go to the previous slide, you can see that, you know, they actually are bang on the same, part, you know, same measurement of 67.4 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So uh, this is a pros. However, these are not direct measurements. You, know, you need a cosmological model that relates your, you know, your measurements to the actual, what you see to the actual uh, estimate of the, of the Hubble constant. So this is like a model dependent estimate of the Hubble constant. On the other side, at, at lower redshifts, we have uh, um, these more, more direct methods that uh, they provide direct methods, direct, direct measurements on the uh, H0, on, on the Hubble constant. Uh, and actually some of them are independent because many of them are using the supernovae as a standard candles to measure distances. Uh, and this, however, these standard candles, the, the luminosity and, and distance to these standard candles must be uh, calibrated using other, other sources of calibrations like uh, Cepheid stars, or like uh, you know, the red tip of the uh, the tip of the red, uh, red uh, giant branches in, in galaxies, and now there are also other methods using like uh, gravitational lensing in galaxy clusters, also using weighted measures in, in around black holes in nearby galaxies. These they are like independent methods that are based, you know, they are more direct. Uh, they do not need to rely necessarily on, on a given cosmological model in order to provide a measurement of H naught. However, they are uh, in the con side for these methods is that they are intrinsically uh, more uh, complicated in the sense that the systems that are being described are highly nonlinear. You cannot have a simple theory describing them, and you, in most cases, need to calibrate, uh, need to calibrate your uh, empirically your, your measurements, and this gives more room for systematics. Right? Um, I'll you know explain this a little bit more in detail right now. But um, so the situation is that you know, of course, you know, this has given rise to a lot of discussion in the last few years. Uh, of course, there may be systematics in the, in the early measurements of H0, although that, looks un, that seems unlikely because uh, you know, different experiments of the CMB are yielding the same measurements. CMB experiments and the LSS measurements of the B scale are, are agreeing very well. Uh, of course, there could be systematics at the low redshift side on these direct measurements, uh, but there also you know, may be room for new physics. And this has prompted a lot of uh, you know, theoretical work, talking about emerging dark energy, interacting dark energy, where gravity, 
but you know, uh, decay in dark matter, you know, rock and roll models, whatever, right? So this, uh, there's a lot of bunch of theory papers coming out practically every week. There are like five or six papers coming, uh, you know, uh, trying to find a, a way to accommodate this discrepancy in the ancient of measurements. And, um, and uh, well, although some of these models have already been discarded by, because they do not satisfy the requirements imposed by the molecular data. Um, so what is the situation? Well, this is, you know, so but last week, this was, was more or less the situation. However, because this is a very dynamic field, they are like breaking news from the last week. So uh, among these measurements, there's one measurement here, which is in green, which is the Holocaust, which is based upon gravitational lensing, which was using quasars lens by galaxy clusters to measure uh, you know, the time delay of multiple images of quasars. Uh, and this, using this time delay, they could provide a direct measurement of H0. Uh, but you know, this example shows how, how systematics may play a role here. Because uh, last week, uh, this, there was a team of, uh, of, uh, of, of cosmologists using uh, cluster, uh, galaxy clusters as gravitational lenses. And they took into account the fact that uh, you need to have some idea of what is the mass distribution of matter within the lenses. And depending what is the matter distribution they assume within the lenses, you may get one result or another. Right? So they you know, simply uh, implemented a pipeline where they accounted in a Bayesian framework for the uncertainties in how the mass, mass distribution works. And they actually, you know, by, by assuming that uh, you just have some ignorance of how matter is distributed within the lenses, they first of all enlarge the, the, the size of the error bars, but then using spectroscopic observation and imaging observations of the stars within those galaxy clusters, they could actually have some priors on what was the matter distribution within the lenses. And their estimate went from 74.5, which is in agreement with the low ratio with the direct estimates, all the way down to 67.4, which was the, the quote for H0 for the, for the early measurement of the Hubble constant based upon BAO scale. So, you know, uh, this so was somehow expected because, you know, one of the experts, well, you know, an expert on lensing, Koshanek, was actually uh, worried about this. The fact that, you know, you need to have a proper, uh, the uncertainties in the, in, the, in the lens model should, you know, in, in, introduce some uncertainty in the measurements of H0. So we have uh, shifted from this uh, scenario to this scenario where the lensing scenario is just shifted with bigger order bars to, uh, to lower values. But however, we still have a bunch of measurements, which many of them which are independent, right? Well, some of them based upon Cephates, some of them based upon, upon uh, uh, supernovae, some of them based upon the surface brightness fluctuations in elliptical galaxies, some of, based, some of them based upon measures, and not all of them seem to be consistently yielding higher values for the H0 down for uh, than obtained from the BEO scale uh, with the CMB and the LSS uh, distribution. So this is an open problem and you know this is a matter of huge debate uh, in the last in the last two years in the last few years. Now I'll briefly talk about Lich, I'm not sure how many minutes I have. Uh, 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 you okay. have another uh, the four minutes. Okay, great. So and I'm really going to talk about another sources of tension. The first one um, is, the, is related to the gravitational lensing of the CMB. The CMB, as it is released at the uh, at relative 1100, and it travels towards us, it has, they, you know, the, the CMB photons are traveling in a straight line, but they are deflected because of the matter distribution, right? And this deflection is coherent in a scale of around one degree or so. Even though this deflection is very small, it is coherent, as I said, in some scales, so you can infer the amplitude of this lensing in two different ways. First of all, you can work at the, at the map level and then compute the, uh, and look for this coherence in the deflection angle of the CMB photons by a four point function on the map. You know, you need to compute a four point statistic and you can may obtain directly what is the amplitude of this lensing, of this, of this deflection of the, of the CMB light rays. However, you may look at the two point function of the, uh, which is called the angular power spectrum of the CMB and the lensing, the impact of lensing there is to actually smear the acoustic peaks. The CMB uh, two-point function, the angular power spectrum has some acoustic peaks, but if you have uh, lensing, uh, then you, what you do is you, you tend to suppress the amplitude of the, of the peaks and the troughs of these acoustic peaks. Um, you know, so you can, the theory predicts that this ALO parameter, which is given the, 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 the amplitude of lensing, should be unity if lensing behaves the way we would expect. However, these two methods to compute lensing do not agree to each other, right? We have learned from Planck that, uh, that the second approach, approach two, is given AL, is given an amplitude for lensing, which is about 15% uh, higher than uh, what approach one provides, right? So actually you can see this plot from the Planck collaboration where you see that, you know, depending on how you combine the data, what you compute on, you only consider the intensity of the CMB, you also combine it with the polarization. You, at the end, you have, uh, you know, like a preference for a value of AL, this amplitude of the lensing, which is slightly higher than one. And this is not understood, 
right? This is not understood. Well, some, yeah, depending who you ask, you know, this, this can be understood because of the, some of the shape of the residuals that have a particular form because of the, of the sky mask and so on. And to, uh, so some people say that, you know, this could be accommodated. But the thing is that uh, when you compare some cosmological parameters, here, omega matter is giving you the amount of matter in the universe. Sigma is giving you the amplitude of the matter, uh, of the matter fluctuations, how the matter density contrast increases over with, because of gravity. And if you compare these contours for different experiments, you see that the Planck contours, which is uh, given by, by the red and the gray, are in tension with those same contours obtained by lensing service. This CHFT lens or KIS service, they are two different galaxy services that are measuring this, the lensing, the shear lensing, in galaxies at lower redshifts. And you see that this tension between the two contours, however, if you allow this, this, this parameter, this A lens, the, if you allow the lensing of the CMB behave weirdly, then you get the blue contour, which is bringing the two sets of contours into agreement, right? And this is kind of weird. So this tension is alleviated. And this is not understood, right? Uh, this is at the three sigma level. This is not as obvious as the issue with H naught. But people are also thinking about this, right? And finally, if you are agnostic about low redshift measurements and you just look at the Planck CMB data, uh, then you find that you know we're thinking that we're living in a flat universe, in a perfectly flat universe. But actually, the Planck data by itself is preferring a universe that is slightly closed, right? Because it has a non-zero curvature, negative curvature, meaning that the universe will eventually you know, collapse again in a, in a, in a, well, in a, in a slightly larger future, right? In a, in a, in a, in a long future and um, in a distant future. So this is, you know, the, 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 uh, the measurements from Planck data on this, uh, on this uh, curvature parameter. And, uh, and you said, you know, and of course this evidence was already for the Planck data release from 2015, but this is also present for different uh, likelihoods that you use, PLIC or, or CAM specs. You're getting, you know, the same evidence that, you know, the data seems to prefer a slightly closed universe upon uh, over a, a flat universe. Uh, and actually, uh, if we lived in a, in a slightly uh, closed universe with some curvature, the problem on the lensing would be gone. So the two problems are actually related, right? Actually, it can be, you know, the, you know, the people critical, the skeptic to these statements say that, you know, the two problems, the curvature and the, and the lensing are all related and are related to the shape of the residuals of the actual measure CMB multiples uh, over the theoretical prediction, right? how the residuals behave, tend to favor this type of models, right? So this is a, an open, this is an open discussion now in the, in the community. However, it turns out that if the universe was slightly closed, then other anomalies, weaker anomalies within the Planck data, which is just the low quadrupole, or the fact that the first uh, multiples in the, in the temperature intensity distribution of the CMB are slightly aligned, or they are very, very much aligned. All these you know, kind of anomalies would be solved if we lived actually in a universe that was, you know, that had a curvature of around minus 0.04. So this is open, right? The thing is that if you compare plant data in this, in this, if you generalize your your, your, your cosmological models and then you consider consider curvature and neutrinos and dark matter and dark depth energy, and then you compare plant CMB data with uh, cosmological data at lower redshifts, then you see that there's no match at all, right? Uh, so you combine buying plant data with BO measurements from the large scale structure, with uh, you know the clustering measurements, uh, measurements of the baryonic acoustic oscillation scale from uh, from cluster, from galaxies and, and crystals at lower redshifts. Uh, they would prefer a flat universe, but however, if you compare it to the to the supernovae or to, to different types of supernovae, you get different contours. Different contours do not overlap very well to each other. So you have really discrepant, uh, you know, discrepant measurements for the same cosmological parameters. So the whole cosmological model seems to fall into pieces if you, if you start to combine the CMB data with, uh, with this low redshift. And in this case, you know, the cosmological model will just fall apart. Right? So this is, you know, this was, this is it. You know, how, to what extent this, this, this curvature of the, this apparent curvature of the universe measured by Planck is, is real or not real, right? If you measure the, you know, if you actually follow this PDF, you know, the chance alignment of having a PDF, a curvature larger than zero or zero is around one part in, in 10,000, if I recall correctly. So the chances are fairly low, right? So this has shown that, you know, relevant, respectable cosmologists in, within the community, for instance, Alejandro Melchiorri or, or Joseph Silk, are writing these kind of papers, present papers, this is from this year, from March this year. They talk about cosmic discordance, you know, uh, you know Planck and luminosity distance data exclude lambda CDN, which was the, the up to today, up to now, the, the concordance cosmo cosmological model. And, you know, also have a, you also have a, a Nobel Prize, Alan Ries, you know, showing that there is a strong evidence for physics beyond the lambda CDN. 
So there's indeed, uh, you know, a lot of discussion about these topics. This has made the whole field of cosmology even more appealing now. <laughs> and, uh, and there's a lot to come in the future, right? Um, so, uh, I mean, there are a lot of ideas trying to, to resolve these tensions. Uh, but, you know, there's also new data coming online in the next few years. And, you know, on the CMB side, you will be able to, you know, to have more precise measurements of the lens, you know, on the small scales. Uh, on, on the galaxy service side, we will also have better measurements of, of, uh, of the galaxy distribution and also on the supernovae. Uh, ho hopefully, we'll have find more and more supernovae and have more precise measurements and, and you know, have more precise ways to calibrate uh, distances at, 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 uh, at lower redshifts. And then you have like new sources of, uh, you can build new tests uh, coming from new observatories. Like, for instance, if you look at the, uh, the, uh, looking at the radio with a square kilometer array, they will all be able to also say something about this problem on the H naught tension. Uh, they will also measure the video scale. And, and then there is like new observables coming online too, like the gravitational waves, where we have you know, the coalescence of, of uh, compact objects, which should also be sensitive to, to, to H naught, to the, to the, to the higher constant. So, you know, we hope that in the next few years, we, you know, we're gonna, probably we're gonna close some questions and open new ones as it usually happens in science. But uh, nevertheless, these are very, very exciting times in, in cosmology. So let's uh, that was all. I'm not sure if I was late or left, or just, or maybe too quick, just let me know. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, thank you, Carlos, uh, very intriguing. We already have uh, at least a couple of questions. So one is, uh, it's, uh, it's a comment, but uh, let me also address it a little bit with my own interpretation of this comment. Uh, and it is about you know, whether the CMB tells you, or Planck tells you that the universe is, uh, is flat or it's not consistent with being flat. Uh, when, uh, what cosmologists do, they always do this Bayesian thing, so they always have priors in there, and therefore you have this degeneracy, there is a lot of prior volume, so you, when you find something like this, you may want to ask yourself whether it's a question of prior volume or it's a question of best fit and you go into all this model testing direction. It's also that uh, there is not just temperature, there is also polarization and there is also the lensing. So if you take Planck everything and not just temperature, then it pushes back towards flatness. So that's one right? of the only you include lensing, right? If you include only temperature and polarization, you still have curvature. At right, the moment you include lensing, then lensing, it shifts yeah. back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. Although lensing is more noisy, we know too, right? So you know the measurement of this four point function is I would say it's more subject to systematics than 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 the so I would say, if, you know, in terms of signal to noise ratio and knowledge of systematics, I would say, I don't know what your opinion, I want to know your opinion about this, Lichy, actually, as experienced you are, but probably there are, there's more room for systematics in the lens, lens measurements than in the angular power spectrum of both intensity and polarization, right? So, I don't know, I'd like to know your opinion about this, actually, since you were signing all these papers <laughs> about uh, all these tensions, do you... But well, anyway, I'm not the one supposed to ask questions. I'll ask My philosophy was always to only include the systematics that are recognized by the authors of the papers and then just go on. Otherwise, you really open a, yeah, a Pandora box. So there's, a, there's another question which I, I want to ask because it's, it comes up over and over again when we talk about the H naught, which says that in, in industry, in, in the, we, we always use Six Sigma to make sure that, you know, really it's uh, what you're seeing, it's real. Uh, while uh, in, uh, in cosmology so far, we were living with three sigma and at three sigma we were already sending the, 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 the papers to nature. And now that we got five sigma, then we call it a crisis. So <laughs> yeah, it's a sort of a different measure. I think, so, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. So finish, 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 finish. Literally, I just wanted to add something. Oh, <laughs> Uh, this question comes up a lot, so and, it, and it's uh, it's more of a discussion point. So there's no yes or right. no answer. Right, right. And then you know this six sigma, five sigma, four sigma. It, this all assumes Gaussian statistics, right? And uh, and they tell us in most of the in most of the cases Gaussian statistics do not apply probably, right? So, but anyway, you know, it is agreed that you know a, a, a three sigma is already a serious evidence. Oh, oh, it is agreed. I'm reading the questions now. Five sigma, not six sigma, even five sigma is 
it's in like, okay, now this is real clear evidence what you have to sit down and, and discuss, right? Um, I don't know, I think that the case for lensing, uh, I'm not saying that the H0 measurements are locally are, are wrong. However, the case of, of the gravitational lensing from clusters, the fact that they, they were overlooking the uncertainty associated to the mass distribution within the clusters, within the lenses, is giving a, a good example on how an, an, an unseen potential systematics or unseen potential sources of uncertainty may kick in and may really skew up your measurements, or at least your error box, right? Or even bias your measurements. And so this, you know, it's hard to be sure that there is no room for that, whatever you do, right? And that's why we need different channels, different observables, different approaches in order to measure the same thing, just to minimize this possibility. This is what we have been trying to do in the past, and then we're getting discordant. We're getting discordant uh, measurements, right? But I think this is healthy, right? This is making us reconsider things, and this is making us learning new things about, you know, how to measure H not at high and low ratios. So in this sense, I think this is very, you know, this is very interesting. <laughs> Uh, okay, I think we've uh, answered uh, all the, the questions that we got and uh, we are uh, almost uh, in perfect timing. So uh, let's not eat more time into uh, the, the, the coffee break, which uh, as we know in conferences are virtual or not as are important as the <laughs> actual uh, conference time. So I would like to thank Carlos, uh, those who have the, Microsoft, uh, the, the microphone off and I'll uh, give you a virtual uh, uh, clap.